Our next speaker is John Ewart from um, Delaware Sea Grant Marine Advisory Service, and he's going to talk about seafood tech update from source to table. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I just want to give some acknowledgments before I start to my colleague, uh, Doris Hicks. We've been working for the last four years um, on a project funded by uh, the Aquaculture Extension Initiative of Sea Grant um, called Aquaculture and Fish Tech 101. We've been going around the country, um, speaking at venues like this, and um, trying to fill people in and uh, seafood professionals and give them an update on what's going on in the world of seafood today. And uh, that includes the seafoodhealthfacts.org website. We've had four regional conferences workshops around the country, so I want to acknowledge um, some of the people who have helped us uh, with those as well. The last one was held in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin about a year ago. Okay, this subject, we've taught, we've had everything from two and a half day workshops to, um, you know, uh, hour and a half sessions. This is the 30 minute version. This is the first time we're going to run through this one, so hopefully I'll be able to get to all this, but uh, I want to talk about the, uh, give you an over view an update on seafood, talk about sustainability and resources, which kind of follows on the first talk here, uh, seafood safety, quality, and handling, and seafood in the diet, and some of these media issues. Uh, we've all seen this before, the uh, static fisheries and rising aquaculture uh, production filling the gap. Um, seafood's one of the highest uh, traded commodities. Um, Basically, we're approaching a 50-50 split with, uh, with aquaculture and fisheries products. Uh, the majority of it's used for food. Per capita consumption on the average around the world is 44 pounds. We're at 15 and a half uh, as of now. Other Asian countries are more into the 90s. So uh, we consume beef and poultry at a rate that other people consume seafood in the world. Um, our fishery landings are considered for the most part to be in about 90% of the stocks are fully or overexploited, um, and there's not really any future uh, significant growth seen from fishery stocks, and so there's an increasing reliance on aquaculture production. If we project out to 2030 and out to uh, even out to 2050, which is what this uh, particular graph shows, seeing the static uh, fisheries production and a demand or a, a need to increase substantially aquaculture production to the point of where by 2030 it's projected that we have to have 62 percent of our uh, seafood production coming from aquaculture. Looking around the world, uh, this particular um, graphic shows the major um, importing countries and the major in yellow, the major exporting regions. Um, We've got Norway up here, and we've got Chile, and they're both known for their salmon uh, exports. Um, but the vast majority of what's coming, being exported in the world uh, for, for seafood is coming from uh, the Asia Pacific region. And if you want to break that down, these are the marine fish that's leveled off, and pretty much there's no new production coming out of uh, the marine fisheries other than the mollusks and seaweeds and things like that, and uh, there's still a large amount of and growing amount of freshwater aquaculture production and, and fishery production. And you look at the regions again, uh, from a fishery standpoint, Asia Pacific region is a, is a major player, accounting for close to half of the products. And, um, but when it comes to um, aquaculture products, it is the predominant uh, player for um, for aquaculture production, and we really the the main uh, country in the Asia Pacific region is China. They are a significant producer when it comes to world fisheries, but uh, they are a predominant uh, producer when it comes to uh, aquaculture products on the world level. In fact, you often see uh, statistics presented as the world excluding China. So they treat Chinese uh, statistics separately from the rest of the world. So zeroing in back on the home front here, this is the Pike Place Market. I'm sure most everyone has had a chance to visit it at one time or another. It's a fabulous place that really is a great display of 
American seafood products, especially from the Pacific Northwest. And the vast majority of these, with the exception of maybe uh, um, bivalve mollusks, all the different species of uh, shellfish, uh, the rest of these are produced from wild fisheries, um, the mollusks pretty much coming from the uh, aquaculture industry. And this is a good reflection of where we are uh, in the United States with about 95% wild, 5% farmed um, in our domestic seafood production, but we're only accounting, uh, even at 15 and a half pounds per capita, we're only accounting for about 9% of that. This number is slowly creeping up. I think it's even 92% or more now, but uh, we are really relying uh, exceptionally heavily on imported seafood in the country to even satisfy our relatively low per capita consumption, uh, which about half and half wild versus farmed. We look and see where this is all coming from. We've got in North America, we've got in, in the Caribbean, in the Americas, uh, we've got a certain amount of, of uh, cross trade uh, that we've been doing, um, but um, all the other regions, uh, Asia Pacific region is, is a source of 50% of what's coming into the country. Looking at the uh, fisheries overview, these figures go up and down. I've looked at them for the last three or four years as I update this uh, presentation, and, and some things are up and some things are down, but the, uh, the average is pretty much a flat line steady. So these are some of the latest uh, increases and declines. Uh, we're looking at a uh, 9.7 um, billion uh, pounds in landings versus uh, worth about 5.2 billion. And we have pretty good representation around the country with the eastern and west coast uh, being some of the major contributors. I've also added uh, some statistics for the Great Lakes. We did this when we had the Great Lakes workshop in last April. Uh, the data is there. It's on the charts, and, but it's never really graphically uh, presented. So whoever in NOAA that may be here to, uh, to help with these infographics, add the Great Lakes. They're, they're not a huge contributor, but but it's, it's worthwhile seeing what they're, they're doing, and they are growing slowly over time. Looking at uh, fishery landings, these circles here represent larger amounts in terms of volume and value, and we see that uh, this region of the, of the country, especially up in Alaska, is a major producer from the standpoint of volume and value. Um, Dutch Harbor, Alaska, um, Aleutian Islands, uh, Kodiak, major, major uh, ports for fishery landings. Uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts is on the charts here, uh, largely because of the sea scallop industry. That's 76% uh, of the value of the New Bedford uh, landings comes just from sea scallops alone. And this has been going on for a good while. Dutch Harbor is in its 19th year of uh, consecutive being a leader, and the same thing with with New Bedford, Massachusetts, is about 16th year. So these, these are relatively sustainable and, and constant uh, levels of production that have been going on. And I will say that, you know, U.S. fisheries are some of the most sustainable fisheries in the world uh, because they have such a, uh, such a uh, regulated management structure. About 80 percent, more or less, this figure is actually down a little bit from previous years, but about 80 percent of what is caught is used for human food, the remainder going into fish meals, oils, different components of fish feeds. And so as we turn to aquaculture, I'm not going to go into, you know, normally I pr you know, provide audiences with just what it is and the different methodologies. We all know about that. Um, we know that it's just more than uh, going on in aquaculture than food, but this is what we're mostly talking about today. Here's a breakdown of the northeastern region or the uh, regional aquaculture centers and the different species. Um, here's some later, latest figures on where some of the growth is. Really the growth in aquaculture that's taking place in the country right now is on the marine side and in particular on um, marine shellfish. That is really where the growth is taking place um, for aquaculture. And here's some of the latest figures. Notice all these different species are marine species. Um, here's the relative contributions from around the country, the Great Lake figures again, about $1.3 billion industry versus the 5.2 valuation for, 
fisheries. So we are, uh, aquaculture is a significant contributor, but a relatively small contributor on the national level. Now these, there's some good news and some bad news here. The good news is, is that we have hit in 2015 up to um, 15 and a half pounds per capita, which is pretty significant because we were about 14.6 the year before. Um, Here's the trend since about 2000. We were up in the early 2000s or so, you know, got up into the 16 pound range. But we've been in really a slow decline over the last, you know, five or six years. And so this is an uptick in uh, per capita consumption. But I want to point out to you the volume of domestic commercial landings and aquaculture products, commercial landings in green, aquaculture products in blue. Uh, value on the bottom and the actual uh, volume of landings. And, you know, this is pretty disturbing. Over the last 20 some plus years, we've had a relatively static uh, commercial fishery production and relatively static aquaculture production. Even though we've had some rise in marine shellfish, it's relative, you know, on the, on the larger scale of things, it's, it's quite small. We've had the value increases. And one of the reasons we've had that is because we have some of the best seafood produced from wild fisheries and from aquaculture in the world, and the world is willing to pay three to four times more for it in export markets than they are than consumers are willing to pay for it domestically. And so this is a, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Here's some figures to give you an idea: uh, aquaculture per capita across the, or seafood per capita across the top with uh, the other different commodities. Um, we are expected to have seafood numbers not hold up at 15 and a half or continue to rise. They're expected to, you know, kind of tick down again or just fluctuate. The others are holding relatively steady. And this graph up here is the different white fish and the different, you know, main tablecloth species and they've been holding pretty much steady uh, all along for, for even a more extended time than shown here. Okay, here's some other trends that I think are kind of very concerning is, uh, this is, um, well, here's our increasing deficits, okay? So that's an increasing trend. I think we were down to, you know, $15 billion edible fishery product deficits. We have a increasing trend in exports, um, and we have an increasing trend going on in our imports, seafood imports. If we look and see where this is all going or coming from, again, we have a major deficit situation going on with the Asia Pacific region. If we look and see where that breaks down, there's Asia and there's four countries here, four Asian countries, uh, approximately 40 to 50 percent of, um, you know, where we're getting the seafood from, as I mentioned earlier. Breaking that down a little bit more in some of the top top species um, amounts to about 17.4 billion in this 2012 figure. 71% um, of that is coming from these countries alone, 12.4 billion dollars. If we look at the import sources just from those countries, 43% of that, seven and a half billion dollars, and that's not accounting uh, current figures up to 2015 and 16. Again, if we look and see where these export markets exist, uh, China is shown the most significant growth. And it's all very high value uh, seafood products. You can see that um, the growth um, trending up. It's over $5.5 billion right now in exports. So we have a situation here where we have the major exporting region in the world. I told you about the fact that we're getting 50% or so of our product from, from uh, that region. Um, they are keeping 50% of the domestic production for their own markets, and those markets are growing as they develop more of a middle class. So those uh, people are not interested in eating carp. They want to eat lobster. They want to eat salmon. They want to eat all the higher value species. So, so there's a trend for more and more product coming into the Asia Pacific region. And uh, probably the most disturbing thing is these are, these two circles, there's a, uh, a green circle and then you can see the uh, outline. 
represent what's projected by 2030 to be future growth in population centers. And you see that in North America, it's not expected to go that up that much. Same thing with Europe, a little bit in South America. That is the projected growth of uh, the Asia Pacific region in terms of population. And they are really going to significantly increase the demand for protein products. They can come from terrestrial sources, terrestrial agriculture. They can come from marine sources or aquatic sources. And you know, the, the question I ask is, what does this mean for our seafood supply if uh, we're getting 50 percent of what we need coming out of that region and they're going to keep, keep it for themselves? So really, you know, world population is projected to grow to 9 to 10 billion people. Uh, increase in animal protein, natural resource uh, demand is going to be quite excessive uh, if you believe all the figures. And uh, really, there's going to be much more competition uh, for energy. And freshwater resources have always been you know, something that people have had wars over. It's just going to be more and more increasing in that direction. But freshwater resources and world population are, are two uh, major considerations. So that brings us to the subject of sustainability. Now, most of us, you know, have had biological background and training. Sustainability was always had to deal with, um, you know, fishery harvest so that, you know, the uh, stocks could maintain themselves and reproduce. This is the new model of sustainability, which is fine. There are, this is a relatively straightforward and simple one. There are many out there that are so convoluted that they're difficult to understand. But we have the, you know, typical biological, but, you know, food safety, social welfare, animal welfare, environmental considerations, um, all combining to contribute to sustainability and then the subject of traceability, where is seafood coming from and what are the sources. So this is the new paradigm that we're operating under from the standpoint of sustainability and it's important for people to get all, you know, agree on a definition of what it is because there are a lot of varying definitions of sustainability. So if we look at the region of the world where 50 percent of the seafood is coming to us from, um, and from the standpoint of sustainability or environment, food safety, you know, the social aspects, I have these in red because they're all in, you know, difficult circumstances. I mean, there's a lot of unsustainability going on in the Asia Pacific region. and. Um, Two of the big ones that are in the news right now is the illegal and unregulated fishing. You may have been reading about that in the media. And then the human rights abuses where, um, you know, people are shanghaied out on boats in Thailand and places like that and, you know, for a month at a time to uh, harvest fish, which goes into the feeds for the shrimp industry and kids deveining shrimp and all these, you know, all these other stories that are out there. One thing you're not going to read about um, in the Asia Pacific region is NIMBY, and we all know what that is, right? <laughs> Not in my backyard. We vote. If, uh, if you're involved in aquaculture uh, in any kind of uh, remotely um, developed area, then you know what NIMBY is. And so this is China. Uh, it's not typical of China, but it's uh, somewhat representative of what's going on in the Asia Pacific region, especially on the marine side of things. And I dare say we're never, ever going to see that taking place in our U.S. coastal waters, <laughs> at least not while I'm around. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. But this is one of the reasons why, reasons why they are the, such a major producer in, on the world stage. Okay. I had mentioned energy, and I think we're also familiar with this um, from a standpoint of uh, energy inputs and environmental impact. Um, you know, beef, uh, poultry, or a beef, swine, poultry, which actually is uh, interesting from a standpoint. It's, it's reasonably uh, efficient, um, especially with all the engineering and development that's taken place. And I read somewhere about uh, taking um, omega-3 fatty acids and, you know, that are, that are produced uh, through GMO technology and fusing that into, into poultry feeds. So in other words, spiking poultry with omega-3s, and that may end up becoming a, a, a scenario that comes to wider spread fruition. I don't know. But uh, one of the things that aquaculture has as an advantage is it's extremely efficient from a standpoint of feed conversion. It's getting better all the time. And I don't have a graphic, but right over here, we need to add seaweeds and um, 
bivalve mollusks because they really are even lower on the scale um, because they don't rely on um, manufactured or any kind of feeds other than natural natural nutrients in the water and, and um, phytoplankton and other detritus. And also aquatic products are very high, uh, rank very highly in terms of conversion efficiencies, uh, protein conversion efficiency, protein content, etc. So, um, you know, fish and shellfish are extremely nutritious and high value products from a standpoint of uh, uh, food source, but also from the standpoint of being produced and what it takes. So then the question becomes, and the uh, first speaker mentioned the, the need for fisheries versus aquaculture. I, you know, I see uh, aquaculture as a specialized form of fisheries. I think that the two really need, you know, it's imperative that they both work together. Uh, we can't afford to have any kind of a drop in um, fishery production because we need that baseline right there and, to, you know, to even uh, give us a fighting chance to build from the aquaculture uh, bridging the gap standpoint. So are fisheries sustainable? Or well, Ray Hilborn from Washington, who's considered to be probably one of the foremost authorities on world fisheries, maintains that most fisheries are sustainable. Ones that are properly managed are sustainable. And I would say that our fisheries in the United States, um, you know, there's a lot of debate around, around whether it's the management practices and some of the other uh, answers. But the bottom line is, is that we, we have some of the best and most sustainable fisheries in the world. So I think that uh, there's a lot of room for improvement here, especially in the international theater. But uh, fisheries are a key component to this whole future process of seafood. Another uh, one is Barry Costa Pierce. Most of you people are familiar with Barry at the University of New England. And uh, he has an article or an interview in the Global Aquaculture Advocate from 2015 that I suggest that you go and check out. It is uh, almost visionary in terms of his point of view on where we're headed and the kind of things that we need to do and what some of the solutions are. Um, and he's been presenting and writing on that subsequently. So uh, Barry Costa Pierce, check him out. Um, see what he has to say. I, I agree 100% with uh, where he's coming from on, on this particular subject. All right, let's talk about seafood safety. We hear a lot about the safety of our seafood supply. We know that we only inspect less than 2% of it. Uh, it's coming in from these uh, other countries, especially Asia. Uh, there's not a real lot of regulation on what's going on uh, with that. There's a lot of uh, potential for antibiotic overuse and things of this sort. So. Um, more or less, we've had, and from a seafood standpoint, we have a downward um, trend in terms of seafood-related illness overall. We're still reading about um, jack-in-the-box hamburgers and, you know, tainted agricultural products, uh, you know, plant and animal and recalls and so on and so forth. Um, not so much with seafood other than the fact that we do have a problem um, with warming temperatures and vibrios with our, in our shellfish uh, industries, especially when it comes to oysters. So there has been an uptick there and the industry is fighting very hard to try to you know, come up with methodologies, uh, you know, keeping things chilled from harvest to market and other, other approaches so that they don't have to get involved in the um, post-harvest treatment as a mandatory step. Now here's some of the things that, you know, when there is a, are inspections, these are some of the categories that are identified. And veterinary drugs is certainly one of them, but there's, there are higher levels of other things going on. Um, in the United States, we don't really rely on inspection per se. I think we could do more in that area, um, better than 2%. But if you look at the logistics of it, it's very difficult in what's coming into the country. Um, but that's why we have, uh, the HACCP program, and it's really geared towards these are the big three um, from the standpoint of food safety risks and with seafood, and that's where the HACCP program comes into play from the standpoint it's based on a, more of a preventative strategy rather than a um, um, one to, uh, for detection. Another thing here is that they have controls for persistent issues, and this is one dealing with mercury. One of my pet peeves, of course, uh, one of the reasons that uh, was mentioned earlier that consumers are so 
confused about what's going on is that, first of all, they're afraid of seafood. They don't understand it. They don't know how to buy it. They don't know how to cook it. I'm talking about not around the coast, but in the rest of the country. They hear about mercury and they get scared to death over it, okay? Uh, especially doctors still telling uh, pregnant women to avoid eating seafood. Um, Nick Ralston from the University of North Dakota, you have to check this out. He was in uh, North, uh, in, at the Aquaculture Conference in San Antonio and discussing selenium as a um, way to um, block mercury toxicity. And this is why John Cooksey asked you to double check your, um, your hand in when, before you print them, <laughs> before they go into per perpetuity. Um, uh, you can find this on the net effects, uh, University of North Dakota edu. Three absolutely excellent fact sheets um, on omega-3s, uh, uh, ocean fish, and the selenium mercury question. Um, basically, this is a, a graphic that, uh, from him showing that selenium blocks the bioavailability of mercury. It's very high in ocean fish, and there's just no way you're going to experience mercury toxicity by eating uh, a wide array of ocean fish and uh, tell every, you know, potentially, uh, you know, childbearing uh, woman or your granddaughters or, you know, whoever, just tell them to eat all the ocean fish that they want because Ralston also said that they are uh, avoiding the omega-3s in, in seafood can lead to a two to six point decrease in IQ potential. Uh, the other question, you know, farm versus wild, uh, it was mentioned earlier that there are people for it, against it, and indifferent. Um, you know, it's again a media issue. One thing to take home with you, all these surveys come down to this. Americans buy seafood based on the price. That is the big driver. What They want to buy the lowest price that they can get. And so all those things combined, we have a situation where regardless of age or gender, where uh, this is where we should be uh, in terms of seafood consumption, and this is where we are. We're, we're in the, about at the halfway point. So that leads to uh, what can we do about it? We've got the seafoodhealthfacts.org uh, website designed for consumers and for professionals. It started in 2012 um, by Steve Otwell from Florida, Doris Hicks, and a whole series of uh, Sea Grant-based uh, uh, seafood technologists. Um, it's been growing every year. The top country, the United States, of course, it's got over 800,000 page views in the last year, about 757 or so thousand um, unique visitors um, from 137 different countries. Uh, around the country, uh, some of the top users really are around the coastal areas and Illinois. Um, covers a range of subjects here um, based on, and that, that changes based on news reports and things like that uh, on different species. There's a link, uh, uh, there are buttons on the front page that where you can share articles, and that really leads to this. Um, some of the top referring sources, besides Google and some of the others, there's another category for those, uh, is that Facebook comes up three times and Reddit. Uh, these are some of the major uh, sites. M Facebook is mobile Facebook. Facebook is the desktop version, and L Facebook is um, one that Facebook has. It's called a link shim, and that's where Facebook um, masks your URL so that uh, you know you can't have it, uh, you know, for hacking and things like that. But anyway, we were really surprised to see that. Um, and so um, we receive a lot of uh, traffic, and really the, it's the idea is the diversity of it from the standpoint of um, have over 800 uh, uh, groups linking to us, everything from the National Fisheries Institute down to Sea Watch. I mean, we even have Sea Watch uh, tapping into us. So uh, uh, I suggest that you look at this um, website and consider linking to it uh, from your websites as well. And I'm short on time, so here are some of the, some of the big take-home uh, messages. I'll let you read them all yourself. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks, you. We can speak with John during the break if you have any questions for him. Thank you.